from the CEO, Sean Kidney, along with our partners at MUFJ and also at FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. I want to say a special thank you and uh, uh, to FICI, who have been working side by side with us to support the development of green bonds in India for many years now, and a particular call out to Rita Roy Chaudhary, who's been the central factor making this happen. So uh, again, thanks for being on this journey with us. What, what I'd like to do is just to make a few introductory remarks. We're in the middle of a crisis, uh, a COVID crisis. We will need to rebuild out of it. There are some learnings for us in this crisis. One is we're learning a lot more about what resilience means for our societies, not only uh, health system, but also what sort of social protections have to be in place when we have these crises in the future. The International Panel of Climate Change Health Committee has predicted that we will see a century of pandemics arising out of environmental degradation. It is now clear from the science that this particular pandemic has been as a result of stressed ecosystems and pathogens jumping between species. This is going to happen again, folks. There will be other crises. Mumbai will be flooded by cyclones at some stage the next 10 years. That will be a difficult crisis for us to weather, and so on, because it, the impacts of climate change are becoming real. While we learn how to better manage our societies in the face of these shocks, to build resilience into our societies, to figure out what we do the next time this happens and learn from this experiment that's going on around the world now with different societies having different kinds of responses, we also need to make sure that we build back better. That is that we create a future that's fit for our children and move away from the past. And that we, at, while we're at it, inoculate against the threat of catastrophic climate change, which is what the International Panel of Climate Change says we will get to if we don't drastically reduce emissions. Of course, in India's circumstance, we have uh, an astounding, fantastic and admirable goal of creating 500 gigawatts of renewables by 2030. And the companies you're going to hear about today have been part, a critical part of achieving that objective. I think we're about 80 gigawatts at the moment. Someone will correct me in a minute, I'm sure. We've made astounding progress in the last couple of years, but there is a lot, lot more to do. There's still a big gap between 80 and 500. Uh, we've heard, we'll heard from a, hear from Robbie and Adani about a mandate they've just won towards that end. What we're doing here is talking about the green bond aspect of financing and refinancing. Those. On this call, we have a number of representatives of a number of our favorite institutional investor partners around the world, from State Street Global, Amundi, BNP Paribas Asset Management, Allianz Bernstein, Daiwa Asset Management, Lombard Audio, and so on, are all represented in the listening audience. So my friends at the issuers, bear in mind who you're speaking to, do your pitch, <laughs> and hopefully you'll tell us about new bonds coming out. A couple of facts that I wanted to share with you before I finish up. We've seen a rapid growth of markets. This has been the fastest growing asset class on the planet, this green bonds class. India has been a significant participant in that particular market. This is what it looks like in Asia, which has also been growing rapidly, with China being the dominant issuer so far in the market. But now we have seen growth from ASEAN in particular, from Japan and other countries. And of course, in India, this is what it looks like. This is why we're thinking about a second way. We're looking at 2020 and what we will see out of the work that's being done by these companies that are represented on the call today. There's a lot to be done here. We have to engage investors globally. When we have talked to issuers in the past, they've said very clearly that their green bond issuance is attracting new investors. And they've identified multiple benefits not simply the benefit of cheaper pricing when they can get it. Engagement, long-term engagement with investors will have a flow on to the equity relationships and other kinds of capital flows as well. That's the lesson we've learned from talking to issuers and investors going forward. I want to finish up here and simply say there is an agenda for the future that we need to address. Around the world now at how we build back better 
green stimulus with jobs has got to be the mantra for this year. There are some things we can do quickly, environmental re restoration and afforestation, water investments in the Ganga, the sustainable agriculture agenda, but solar, 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 and renewables and renewables and renewables have got to be a part of this. We do need to institutionalize resilience. And that is look at how we make sure that our food production can be more resilient in the face of the increased heat intensity we're going to suffer in summer across northern India in future years. It will be more than just the 46 degrees we had in Delhi a couple of weeks ago. It'll be for weeks on end. We have to prepare for that and prepare our agriculture and our cities for that and our health systems and so on and so on. Of course, we do need to think about the transition away from fossil fuels. In our building back better, we do need to think about conditionality or aviation, shipping autos. Get your emissions down, please, everyone. And fossil fuels, the same thing. In India, we know this transition is underway. We'll be interested to hear from some of the speakers about that. And there's an opportunity here, you know. This is an opportunity. India could be issuing INR sovereign green bonds to tap the incredible enthusiasm that's around the world. We've had green bonds issued in India in the last, sorry, in, in Europe in the last couple of months at a variety of rating levels that have been getting 10 times, 11 times, 14 times over subscription. These are fantastic results. The demand is extraordinary from investors for this particular theme, and the demand is there for sovereign issuance as well. If anyone at Ministry of Finance would like to meet some of the investors who are telling us they want an INR, green sovereign bond, come back to me and I'll arrange a call for you because I can tell you they are keen. But in the meantime, Gaurav, take us through our fantastic panellists today. Thank you, Fiki. Thank you, MUFJ, for doing this. And thank you, speakers, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Sean. And uh, I think uh, interesting uh, uh, prelude to uh, our conference. I've just been told that the conference is sold out, the webinar. So the platform allows for a maximum of 400 attendees, and we've already touched that number. So I'm actually getting a lot of messages from people who have not been able to enter. Uh, also, I think just for the sake of uh, you know uh, the panelists, I think uh, it's important to note that we have over 30 institutional in investors. I'm talking about individual institutions and over nine multilateral organizations also attending. Uh, the number of people across these uh, organizations is over 50. So again, uh, I think uh, fairly encouraging. Uh, so thank you for that, Sean. I think uh, at the outset, uh, we have an excellent panel. Uh, I'm Gaurav from MEFG and I'm the moderator. And uh, just to put things in context, we have across our four uh, external panelists, uh, organizations which have issued about 40% of all outstanding green bonds from India. So that's a huge number. They represented four out of the top five green bond issues from India till date. And I think uh, based on what you're going to hear from them, uh, they continue to be focused in this space and uh, It'll, be, it'll lead to some interesting conversations, hopefully. Uh, quick word of introduction. We have with us the CFO and the community of SBI, Mr. Venkat Nageshwar. Uh, he is in, in charge of the international operations and is also sits on a number of committees of the bank, including the credit committee, and is a part of various Reserve Bank of India and SEBI committees. Uh, we have Robbie, he's the group CFO of Adani. I think uh, uh, his, uh, agenda has been to spearhead the group strategy in terms of international uh, capital markets. And he was also instrumental in bringing Total as an operational partner for all of Adani's solar uh, operations. Uh, we have uh, Kailash from Renew. Uh, Kailash is uh, the co president of corporate finance and has a lot of experience in corporate finance and investing. Uh, he's actually spearheaded over six and a half billion dollars of equity and debt raise for Renew Power. And uh, we also have Pawan with us. Uh, Pawan is a CFO of Azure Power. And uh, he's had a very illustrious track record in the space. I think he was one of the pioneers of issuing green bonds in his early avatar. And has had stints across various organizations, including Crystal, Ernst & Young, Indian Oil, and Yes Bank. And uh, we'll, it'll be interesting to see his experience, not only in Azure, but how has he seen the green bond market evolving in India. And uh, last but not the least, we have Augusto King. Uh, he's the head of our capital markets business across Asia. 
um, more than 30 years of experience in this business and has done stints earlier with RBS, HSBC, Merrill Lynch, and JP Morgan. So without further ado, I think uh, there's going to be an interactive session. So I would request the attendees to send over the questions and we will uh, address it to the various panelists. Uh, but uh, in order to kick things off, uh, kick start things off, I'm going to ask the first question to the panel in turn. So uh, Venkat, uh, the first question is addressed to you. Uh, so being the largest bank in India and you know the national champion, uh, I think this is something which is very topical and will put a bit of context into what we're going to discuss. How do you see the impact of COVID on the Indian economy? And what is your green ESG financing strategy going forward? Thanks uh, to the Climate Bonds. Thanks to Fiki for organizing this particular uh, uh, seminar in such an unprecedented uh, times. It's one of the type which we have never seen before and, uh, and hopefully will not see in the future, this type of situation. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, this is, these are the times where the crisis has started off from the health and then it moved into the economy, it moved into the financial markets. Earlier, we have seen various crises in our lifetime, but we have never seen a crisis of this magnitude and the way it which translated from the health crisis to the economy and uh, the depth is as we as we speak now the impact of it is still not known uh, yes i uh, uh, Jane kedney had uh, very validly mentioned about the impact of the uh, the, uh, the climatic impact and if you're not going to care for the green then the future is not uh, is not safe State Bank of India, being a responsible banker, being a responsible uh, corporate citizen, we, we take sustainability as the most important thing. And we make, had made this as a part of our value statement when we, when we have drawn our vision, mission, and value statements. The, uh, and and, and uh, as a responsible lender, one of the important points, Gaurav, we mentioned is BI is the is the market leader. Market leader, not just in the sense that uh, uh, we occupy more than 25% of the market share in advances. We have more than 22,000 branches. We have branches every nook and corner of the country. And during the COVID situation, one of the things that which is not expected, and most of us, most of you people must be sitting at home, working there, but it's in State Bank of India, where I take pride in saying that 98% of my branches were working. 99% of my ATMs were working. We were serving across 490 million customers across the country. But the number of customers are much more than the population of US or population of European countries. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, State Bank of India in this current situation, of course, the, the, as I said in the beginning, the magnitude of the damage is still not known, but the banks are well poised now. I mean, I'm not going to debate about how the banks are poised and how the banks are going to take it forward, but the banks in India are reasonably well capitalized. They have uh, the, the made necessary provisions for the legacy assets, and we are, uh, and, and the digitalization is so well ahead post monetization, the banks are well set to take this problem, which is going to come forward. But having said that, let me look to a step forward and see what we're doing for the uh, uh, for the climatic bonds or for the sustainability. As uh, in the beginning of what I said, State Bank of India has taken sustainability as one of the value statements. And accordingly, we uh, raise these green bonds and we are one of the lead issuers. We did raise $800 million of green bonds during the last two years. And specifically in the last year, 2019-20, even in the period during March 23rd, we did raise $100 million of green bonds when the whole market had uh, come to a grinding halt, bond market had come to a grinding halt. Thanks to you, Gaurat, and your entire team, that we could raise these particular funds. Uh, and one of the important things that we do, I mean, the, the, the funds that we raise from these green bonds, we have financed 
almost uh, uh, those projects which had ensured that 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions have been reduced. With these particular uh, bonds that have been issued, we ensure that we have financed those projects which has enabled the reduction of almost 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide. In addition to that, we have also financed 241 solar projects. We have installed 10 windmills for our capital work. And, uh, and, and uh, in addition to that, we continue to be the largest financier, not just for the solar projects, for the wind projects, for all the uh, sustainable energy products. And it's an ongoing process, and State Bank of India strongly believes, as a responsible corporate citizen, that future has to be taken care of. Thank you so much. Uh, Robbie, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the recent news, I think uh, congratulations. Uh, Adani has recently won the bid uh, for the world's largest solar uh, contract uh, in terms of photovoltaic power plant and uh, also a manufacturing capacity of two gigawatts. So can you please tell us something more about you know your plans in this space and how do you see it fitting in? Thank you. I, from from Rani's point of view, uh, uh, we uh, we are on a transformational journey. Uh, we have India's largest and one of the top ten um, global infra platforms, uh, which means that all across infrastructure, we are involved in the in the chain of from logistics to ports, to airports, to power generation, power distribution, power transmission, power retail, gas distribution, and gas transmission to cities. So we have very large footprint with the consumers. We have a very large uh, responsibility in that sense. So, so today, uh, across our businesses, we would, uh, we would directly supply energy to in the next three years to approximately uh, give or take uh, 12 million households. So it's bigger than most countries um, uh, in terms of the, the sheer volume of people that we will directly supply. Uh, so that puts us in a very, uh, 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 in a situation where we have to uh, be consistent with the government's uh, agenda and government's views. And with the Honorable Prime Minister uh, making a strong commitment in 2015 as to India's uh, desire to be a leading uh, light in, in the fight against uh, issues we face regarding climate, uh, we are committed to that. And we ourselves, uh, that means, uh, put ourselves in a pathway of a transformational journey. So just to give, give people who are listening in, and especially Sean, because we've had, uh, although he's the host, um, we've had bad experience with Sean. And uh, just to put, put Adani infra platform in context, in 2010, we were primarily a typical fossil fuel mining company. About 80% of what we did was in mining and fossil fuels and about 20% in other areas. In 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, that number now is reversed. We are about 70 to 72 odd percent in non, so we are in transmission, distribution, renewables, logistics, everything that has a footprint and plays a part in emission reduction. And we are, we will, and going forecasting next 10 years and just five years where we have commitments made public, our capex in our capital plans in green and green related infrastructure are about 90% of our total investments, which means that we will be one of the only major mining company that would have transformed itself from primarily a mining related entity into a green led infrastructure platform. 
last year we approached the global market for the first time with our pure solar and wind assets which are part of adani green and we had a bitter experience um, that shown group did not certify our bonds as green although 100% of that was for the purposes of solar as generation so 2 gigawatt of solar generation bonds were refused to be certified in may last year and in and then in october after the experience of may we did not approach the climate bond initiative and within that time frame our commitment to solar and wind generation has multi increased multi fold we are on track to complete approximately 14 gigawatt in the next 3 years and 25 gigawatt by 2025 that would put us in one of the largest pure solar and wind generator in the world so our plans are that we would have close to 10 to 12 billion dollars of issues related to capital market issues related to green and green infrastructure so we have massive plans the plans are aligned with the with the desired aim of honorable prime minister and i must say that in relation to the last tender that it was a massively massive bold step supported by the administrative machinery of the indian government as well far reaching and progressive that in one go um a contract for 8000 8000 megawatt was issued and and accepted by us um we would complete that on time um uh, within um, our time periods so so we are looking forward to issuing uh, uh and participating with our investors in the global uh, uh capital markets additionally also we have further about uh, 6 or 7 billion dollars of commitment to support uh, to de develop india's transmission network to cope with the um uh, variable renewable power so we are committed to spend about 6 to 7 billion dollars in that space to ensure that all of the uh, prime minister's commitment of 450 gigawatt is met and our network transmission and distribution can cope with this so we we are committed on two fronts um, both the production and also delivery of this power to households and we are committed to invest in both we will invest that would be our single largest investment over the next 5 uh, years thank you Robbie, I've got to jump in. I'm afraid. Uh, I just want to say we applaud what you're doing at the Columbus Initiative on the on the solar side. It's absolutely fantastic, and we will shout from the rooftops. Of course, you know that our job is to push you on the coal side and to welcome you on the green side. And there's a longer conversation I'd like to pick up for you about that. And I want to especially commend the work that's happened in the last since we've spoken last, which is some time ago, in terms of further plans and this new thing. So I just want to. put on the record that we applaud and are incredibly supportive of your renewable plans and uh, we're keen to see more let's pick up that conversation later after the other panelists but uh, yeah, thank yeah. you for the shout outs yeah 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 sure and thanks for that i think nobody can say that this uh, webinar is boring so far <laughs> uh, i i think uh, kailash uh, i'll come to you uh, i think uh, so uh, you basically won a recent uh, reverse auction Uh, for supplying a project, uh, basically power through solar energy around the clock. Can you tell us something about this? And uh, I think the size is also quite respectable. It's four hundred megawatts. Uh, so this is the first in many ways in India, right? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, you know, obviously, you know, we have been uh, uh, working in the renewable energy now for the last many years. So we are India's largest uh, renewable energy company. uh and you know we are always expected to also be at the forefront of uh, all these innovations uh which is what we also try to do uh i think uh, you know energy transition in india is very important uh the move towards renewable energy is very welcome uh, ideally should have happened a few years ago 
but nevertheless you know never uh, is better late than never uh, i think uh, you know the objective here is that you know we want to make renewable energy more of mainstream uh, energy uh, you know it is currently infirm and hence you know it's not as uh, widely adopted uh, the objective here was to sort of ensure that you know you are able to supply energy uh, around the clock uh, which means that uh, you know most of the uh, consumption requirements would be met through renewable energy uh, for the off taker uh, which in case in this case is uh, seki and through seki there are a few uh, union directories including Delhi who may end up buying this energy uh, the the size is 400 megawatt uh, where you know the condition layout that you know we have to supply 80 percent of that power uh, in terms of plf uh, we all know that a regular uh, you know solar project gives a plf of 20 21 percent uh, wind projects may give a plf between 35 to 40 percent uh, based on the new technology uh, in this case, uh, what we will have to do is we'll have to use a combination of both uh, wind and solar uh, to be able to get up to that 80% requirement, which means that we will have to, uh, you know, oversize the project uh, and, uh, you know, there would be supply of energy uh, totally through renewable energy sources. Now, of course, it's possible that there would be times at which uh, the power would be surplus because, you know, in case, uh, you know, both wind and solar are delivering, you know, higher PLFs, then you will end up supplying more than what the requirements of 400 megawatt are, in which case we will have to end up selling, selling some of that energy uh, at the exchange. So it's a large project. It's going to be, you know, more than a billion dollars in terms of capital expenditure. It's going to have uh, uh, a component of power which will be sold uh, at the exchange. Uh, and because capital requirements will be large, you know, we would obviously go for, uh, you know, some sort of a green bond issuance in this project also uh, once it's fully set up. And here again, I would like to add that uh, this is not the only project that, uh, you know, is meeting uh, the uh, requirements of the government in terms of making renewable energy more mainstream. Uh, we also won the peak power project uh, a few months ago in which uh, you know we will be supplying energy during the morning and the evening peak uh, and again uh, you know there also the tariffs are very competitive uh, and you know it's just basically the objective is to uh, increase the adoption of uh, renewable energy uh, as we go forward thank you for that i think uh, it's groundbreaking in many ways and i have another follow up question which i'll get around to you uh, hi pawan can you hear us? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I think uh, Azure has had a, I mean, uh, interesting journey. I mean, uh, it's been one of the earliest issues of the green bonds in India. Uh, slightly different question with CDPQ, a majority shareholders along with IFC. Uh, what's the strategy going forward for Azure? So thank you, Adam. Thank you, Climate Bond Initiative. Thank you, Fiki. Uh, thank you, MFG, for this uh, conference. Uh, very honestly, uh, we as a platform are uh, very different from any others, right? Uh, uh, and as you rightly say, uh, we are 75% owned by CDPQ, uh, which is one of the largest uh, pension fund, which own 51%, and another 25% by World Bank Group, like uh, IFC and the GI of their fund. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know that uh, uh, ultimately, all of uh, a company, a company serves at the pleasure of all of the stakeholders. And uh, the way our philosophy has always been. To build a very conservative platform, uh, we are not at all changing any growth. We never say we are in India's number one, number two, number three, and uh, we we don't care. To be very very honest, India India is a, is, a, is a very very uh, uh, it provides a lot of opportunity in the sector. We keep looking looking at all opportunity. Whenever we see there is a profitable uh, a strategic opportunity for us, we have our shareholders to support. We uh, we have a very deep pocket, long term patient shareholders. So we don't have a, thank God we don't have a problem of equity. And then uh, the lenders have also been very, very supportive. Uh, as you know, that we, we, we constructed around 17 odd projects. We bundled and issued our first green bond in 2017. And then we took some time, we bundled another 11 projects. And then we came after two years to the market and we issued uh, a, a, a green bond too uh, for 350 odd million. And again, we are now focusing on building uh, projects which are in the pipeline. Uh, we, uh, we actually, uh, along with Adani, uh, we bid uh, so uh, when there was a manufacturing linked uh, PPA tender, again we found that uh, tender very very strategic for us. 
a profitable tender, having a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, impact on the country, on, on, on our platform. And we bid and we, we, got, uh, we, we, we got close to a one gigawatt of manufacturing uh, linked uh, uh, a four gigawatt of uh, PPA. And for which I think for first two gigawatt alloy we have already received, other two gigawatt we have not yet received that is in process. So idea from our side, uh, the, the objective is always to, to, to chase good quality projects, uh, construct that for life. We have been holding our assets for, for our life and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, keep, keep, uh, keep within the very, very strong uh, liquidity and prudence limits. Uh, being, being a listed entity also, uh, uh, we, we, are, we, are list, we, are, we are listed in New York Exchange and both our green bonds are in Singapore Exchange. So we have very, very high disclosure standards. Uh, for example, uh, uh, like for all other issuers, we have to report uh, for our green bond portfolio performance twice a year. And for our full company, uh, the level of detailing and disclosure, I would, I would urge all of you to refer to our 20th that we file every year and uh, a couple of weeks from now, uh, we'll be we'll filing, our, filing our revised 20th. So entire focus is on, on very high uh, conservatism and prudence and liquidity. Uh, so strategy uh, uh, remains got uh, uh, to, to, to remain uh, within, uh, within a very strong uh, credit boundaries. Uh, remain uh, remain uh, very 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 focused on liquidity and uh, and uh, uh, reasonable leverage and and uh, for example uh, the one of the primary reason why we come to green bond market is that uh, that helps us refinancing our exposure right so so you free up your domestic uh, lenders limit then uh, uh, then uh, the the ideal way is that when you are doing the construction it is better you leverage your your project to a little lower than the the, the extent that the project can afford uh, so that uh, you mitigate the construction risk. And then once the projects are operational, you can go whole hog uh, and then uh, talk about the performance, get a good rating, talk to the investor, and then leverage to the, to the extent which is comfortable, justified by cash flows. And the process you get some top up, which helps you to, to, uh, to use uh, to fund part of the equity needs, right? And then uh, I think uh, this also widens uh, in a big, big way your, uh, your investor pool, right? So when your green bond, green bond performs, uh, because uh, ultimately you, uh, it's, it's easy to raise capital, right? It's very important to cut to consistently uh, tell investors that your portfolio is performing. Uh, so, so uh, I, I don't want to talk much about that. We have we have all the investors who, who know our uh, who know our portfolio uh, well. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, just just to summarize, our idea is to remain very focused, uh, be very conservative, be very prudent, and and uh, keep keep moving. I think there's a lot of opportunity, and uh, we 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 believe that we we'll continue to uh, get choices and we can continue to build profitable projects. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, coming to you, Augusto, I mean, uh, from an international perspective, uh, how do you see green bond issuance evolving in the region? I mean, what are issuers and investors in the region telling you? Well, certainly, I guess, uh, again, th thanks, Gaurav, and, and uh, happy to be on this panel with uh, very distinguished uh, speakers. I think from a uh, from an issuer perspective and from an investor perspective, we certainly have seen a significant growth uh, in the market. And in fact, you know, we have now also go beyond just talking about green bond issuances to just general ESG uh, you know, issuances, i.e., you know, people looking at you know, issuances that is related to uh, things outside and beyond just financing a green project. So the awareness has certainly increased significantly uh, in Asia, both issuer and investors. So as a result, we have seen a lot more issuers coming from different, uh, from different uh, countries in the region. Uh, recently, you know, we have also seen quite a lot of uh, requests uh, out of Thailand, for example, uh, and MUFG is involved in a couple of those uh, initiatives in Thailand. So certainly the issuer side of the equation has actually grown significantly. On the investor side, we are also seeing that catching up in Asia. Of course, the awareness uh, out of uh, out of the out of EMEA out of US is has always been pretty strong or very strong. Uh, Asia, in that sense, has already started to catch up. When we are doing roadshow now, and because of COVID, we are no longer doing physical roadshow. We're doing you know virtual roadshow. Uh, in fact, you know for customers that we have or issuers that we have brought to the market of late, uh, when we do these uh, you know uh, uh, conference calls with investors. Uh, ESG related questions always come come out, i.e. they will be asking you know, issuers and say, look, what is your general ESG policies? So uh, I think that awareness certainly has, has grown. Uh, a lot of issuers are asking us whether that translates into pricing. And I think at this point in time, I think the pricing in the implication is not that distinctive 
but I'm a big believer. Once you have a pool of investors gathering that momentum, then it will eventually translate into pricing. We are also seeing from our home market, Japan, a lot more investors asking about you know, ESG and green initiatives. And in fact, some of the uh, investors have said, you know, I, we, we know it takes time to actually put um, a, 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 a green bond or ESG bond together, but we don't mind buying a private placement because we want to actually be involved in that ESG initiative because uh, my investors behind us want us to be uh, seen as supporting the environment. So I think that overall you know, awareness has significantly increased. And I, in fact, I think definitely heading in the right direction, uh, supporting uh, 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 Asian issuers uh, with the ESG uh, uh, agenda. Thanks for that, AK. Uh, coming back to uh, Venkat, sir, I mean, uh, I think uh, if you look at the other panelists, they have you know, assets which are in the renewable energy space. So one of the things increasingly we hear is that investors are also concerned about the impact assessment as to, uh, you know, uh, in terms of green bond issuance, what you issued, what you financed, what is the impact? Uh, as a financial institution as a bank, how do you address a query in terms of what you're financing? How do you assess the impact of that on the environment? One of the important things that we do, uh, uh, as a bank, uh, it's, I think we are the only bank in India which is coming out with a sustainability report. Every year we publish it, and this year also we're going to release it along with uh, our uh, uh, annual report. It's going to be a separate report on which uh, we give very details about how we have utilized this particular bond money or the money that we raise from the multilateral agencies in order to fund the green projects. The, uh, one, of course, uh, uh, the, the certification is taken from the uh, from the CBI before uh, we, we issue the bonds. And since we are a regular issuer, we don't go for the certification uh, on a regular basis. And then we do submit our assessment report uh, by, from a third party on an annual basis. But one of the important things that I would like to mention, as I said, is own, we come out with a very, very exhaustive impact. We are finalizing our report right now, uh, the sustainability report, which, which, which covers very exhaustively what are the various steps that have been taken by the bank to ensure that sustainability is being taken care of by us. Thank you for that. Uh, Robbie, uh, uh, in terms of increasingly uh, green-oriented uh, investor world, uh, what is Adani's policy regarding, you know, ESG? Independent of green um, bonds, overall from uh, Adani infra platform perspective, we have a formal policy. Um, uh, two of our companies already report integrated reports of ESG, uh, third will start this year. And we have uh, we have uh, uh, six listed companies. Um, one we are going to, uh, we be planning to delist. But so uh, all of our listed entities will have integrated ESG reporting by next year. Uh, in fact, uh, we will also be seeking formal ESG ratings for all of our uh, listed infra companies. So we're very much committed to that uh, in terms of, but more importantly, uh, in, in rather than looking at it as a box ticking exercise, one of the things that we are, and I'm pleased to share it with, since we got large investor base, a lot of those investors already would know this, but with the wider panel, um, we are, we are uh, putting together uh, at each of our boards, formal assurance committees. So, for example, you know, for accounting, the board has audit committees. Um, but for similarly for ESG, uh, we are going to all of our listed companies will have uh, formal committees, which will be corporate responsibility committee, that will go through the assurance that uh, that whatever we are supposed to do as part of our uh, corporate citizenship in terms of ESG, and it, uh, it matters. It also goes into you know being a good tax citizen, being a good um, responsible citizen in relation to employees, vendor development. So there are many aspects of this which are 
beyond ESG, but which are very important when you're trying to develop an ecosystem. And for us, uh, uh, that uh, will be backed by each board having a, a CRC, Corporate Responsibility Committee, which will ensure that all, uh, from an assurance perspective, which will go through this. Um, and naturally, it will flow through to Adani Green Energy Limited also, because it's it being, a, being one of our, uh, our listed entities. Uh, green bonds itself, you know, for, uh, for us, uh, uh, you know, unlike uh, uh, co-mingled assets, our Adani Green Energy entity is pure play, solar and wind. It has nothing. It doesn't even have hydro. Um, we are we 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 don't consider hydro to be same green as uh, solar or wind assets. So so it is pure play solar and wind assets, um, and therefore, hundred percent of whatever it does, hundred percent of its capital remains within that envelope. Um, therefore, for formal commitments that uh, that envelope will be always be honored and uh, committed to. Uh, so from 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 that aspect, uh, a. a at a wider platform level, um, we we hope to complete all of this uh, Gaurav, by 30th September 2021 across all our entities. Now your mic is muted. Yeah. I think uh, this is extremely encouraging, and it's all part of the transformation journey you touched upon in your opening comments. So thank you for that. Uh, Kailash, I'll come to you. I think, again, uh, another indication of the innovation you are actually driving. Uh, you recently acquired uh, an artificial intelligence startup called Climate Connect. Uh, what's the thought process behind, uh, you know, getting into this field? <laughs> no, so, Climate Connect, uh, it's a group of, uh, uh, you know, young uh, data scientists and data engineers. Uh, the objective is to sort of use uh, digital digital uh, initiatives uh, and data uh, to drive our operations and performance. Uh, the objective is that uh, you know we obviously generate a lot of data, and uh, you know we end up uh, you know having to manage and uh, you know use this data to predict uh, you know how the future what the future holds for us, and and that's what uh, you know we're trying to do by this uh, purchase. Uh, what this team will do is they will help us uh, tighten uh, what we do on the scheduling and forecasting front. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we know the objective is to make RE uh, more mainstream uh, energy. Uh, so if we are able to enable the uh, off-takers to plan the energy purchases by telling them exactly how much we will supply when, uh, then it is it's just uh, you know that much more better for them uh, to, you know, plan their own uh, procurement uh, and at the same time you know they're encouraged to improve or increase the uh, use of renewable energy for their requirements uh, this platform will enable us to uh, be better at that scheduling and forecasting and then also you know provide this uh, as a service uh, to other uh, companies to overall improve the ecosystem uh, of uh, of performance uh, for renewable energy Wow, this is really cutting edge stuff. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think more power to you in terms of you're moving beyond just assets and you're thinking about services now. So, uh, excellent. Coming to you, Pawan, uh, I think uh, you've been a very early adopter of green bonds. And as a professional also, uh, you've actually done this in your previous organization. So, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts in terms of how do you, how have you seen the green bond market evolve in India? And, uh, what could be the drivers for the green bond market, according to you? So, uh, just to just to understand, are you talking about uh, green bond global green bond market for Indian issuer, or are you talking about the Indian green bond market which doesn't really exist? I think the 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 former actually. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I'll I'll see. Uh, uh, ultimately, we know that globally there's a very strong high yield uh, bond investor base, right? Uh, it takes time for investor to gain confidence. Uh, so, of course, whenever you start uh, uh, and whenever you, uh, whenever, whenever, uh, whether as a country we started uh, uh, issuing high bonds, definitely uh, the track record, the performance, the perception, uh, uh, India, we, we, we should remember that India's sovereign rating is also not very high, right? We are just barely an investment grade rating. 
And now with Modi's, uh, Modi putting us on negative outlook, uh, uh, is, is something uh, which is again creating a lot more pressure. But again, that is temporary. And glad that SNP has reaffirmed our rating. So, so that that also is there. But coming back to uh, uh, see, uh, so there is a there is a pool of capital which is available. What is important is that uh, whether it is a country or a sector or a issuer, when you get an opportunity to to place your bond for the first time, then you have to deliver performance. As long as you're able to deliver performance, and uh, Sean so 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 uh, aptly talked about resilience, right? Uh, all all business, all all every, 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 everything will go through rough patches. And if you're able to prove that uh, that that uh, the, the, the 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 issue that you did actually can absorb all the shocks, and and uh, what you commit or what you project, a uh, basis which you're getting getting, getting rating, you're making your investor presentation, you're doing the road shows. Uh, then, then and if as a follow-up you're able to consistently deliver that what you projected is being uh, being, being coming then your subsequent issuances will see a lot more appetite so i think it's just a very uh, the journey has been encouraging at this band uh, and a lot of credit goes to all the issuers uh, who actually and, and and the sector which got all the support for example you know, you know that in this difficult uh, covid time right when there was a power demand which came down there was a lot of uh, pressure on the discoms because they because the industries got shut and india industries paid a higher share of the of the, of the, of the total uh, electricity bill so when uh, we were seeing that discoms are, are are not able to sell their power discoms may not be paid because the industries are shut then what will happen to renewable energy right and uh, while all those uh, regulatory framework that uh, that renewable is a must run it is a dim generation but when you are passing through tough time uh, you really don't know how how all these uh, all these statutory or regulatory uh, framework will actually actually uh, uh, unfold, and we're glad to see that uh, that all those which were which were being talked about, which were written, were all honored, right? So renewables were not curtailed, renewables were paid on time. So all these things again gives a lot of confidence to us as as a company in this sector, and builds a lot of confidence uh, uh, to to our to our to our bondholders, right? So, for example, I tell you, we used to get tons of calls, of course, being a listed entity from our shareholders also, uh, but equally from our bondholders, that how your RG group cash flows are, are you facing any liquidity pressure? And then uh, we, we kept responding on an individual basis, then we had a very detailed discussion at the board level. We painted multiple scenarios, uh, wherein uh, what will happen if there is a curtailment, what will happen if there is a, there's a payment delays, and in all the scenario, we could come out that we are very, pretty, pretty strong in liquidity, in all the scenario and we are good uh, at least in the end of this fiscal which ends in march 2021 and we then we release a 6k in nyse and and then we had we we held a large call with investors so idea is that uh, if you're able to consistently uh, uh, demonstrate uh, uh, talks really doesn't help you beyond beyond, beyond, beyond certain point right so if you're able to consistently demonstrate that uh, that uh, that that cash flows are protected uh, the bondholders are, are are getting assurance that they'll be paid on time but they'll not be any fault then i think demand is demand is not a problem right so i'll i'll, I'll describe that as a primary reason why 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 we are getting a lot of uh, lot of a lot of support from all the investors and why people are looking at uh, indian issuance or the sector issuance or or azure issuance sure so uh, thank you for that um ak uh, are you on yes i am okay uh so there's been a talk of, uh, I think, a, a slight uh, segue for you. Uh, increasingly, we hear about uh, COVID or social bonds. Uh, what's your take on that? I, I certainly I think there is, a, uh, there is a lot more momentum uh, when it comes to social bonds. Uh, obviously, because of late, uh, because of uh, impact of COVID, um, there are certainly increasing issues uh, that are that are uh, driven by that initiative, including MBFG. You know, we have issued our own COVID. Uh, uh, bond as well. So I think beyond that, I guess uh, there will be a lot more uh, opportunities when it comes to any you know, social driven kind of like uh, you know, or socially targeted uh, issuances. Uh, we have seen uh, bonds issuances, issuances out of Korea that support uh, farmers, for example. Uh, we have done a deal in Thailand for our own sister company, Queen Street Bank, uh, gender bond to support uh, female entrepreneurs. So I think uh, all these will gather a lot of attention. So I, I do believe uh, investors uh, will be uh, will be a lot more uh, focused uh, in looking at how you know issuers supports uh, the society in general. And this goes beyond just green issuances. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a big big agenda. 
but I think supporting social um, uh, uh, responsibilities uh, would, would also be a, 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 a interesting uh, phenomenon. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, so, uh, Venkat sir, in terms of uh, SBI, I mean, you are not just an issuer, you are probably one of the largest in investors of offshore bonds issued by Indian companies. Uh, how do you look at green bonds as a, as a choice for investing? Uh, yeah, uh, you're right, Gaurav. Uh, uh, we uh, we do have presence in an almost 32 in 32 countries, and we have very active treasuries. We do invest in various bond portfolio across the globe. Uh, one of the important decisions, of course, is to look at the 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 investment grade of the uh, of the particular bond issuance, because I don't go for a high yield bonds. I always look at uh, investment grade bonds. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the messages that we have very strongly communicated to all our uh, treasuries or investment tasks is that if it's going to be a green bond issuance, I wouldn't mind even if I get a yield of five basis points lesser. So that's a message that we are given so that we want to support this particular initiative and therefore a bit a less return on the green bond issuance is welcome and I'm, I, we are fully supportive. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Robbie, one of the questions which I think uh, uh, Fiki has asked us to address to the panel is, from a policy perspective, uh, what do you think uh, can be done better uh, to support uh, green issuances or green financing? And since uh, you know uh, you straddle across a lot of businesses, I'm sure your interactions with the various industry bodies, et cetera, would bring out certain things which you thought, I mean, which probably could be uh, streamlined or done better. So uh, over to you. Quite a few things, uh, uh, maybe if I can uh, uh, start. Uh, see, uh, generally RBI is very, uh, 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 very, very particular about uh, the way refinancing uh, can happen, right? If you're if you're an INR borrowing, or if you have a ECB borrowing, and uh, if you have to refinance through a foreign currency loan, right? It 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 is it is it is fairly uh, fairly fairly regulated. Our request is, uh, if it is possible, uh, knowing that uh, knowing that uh, we have huge plans uh, in terms of country to scale up our renewable energy uh, renewable energy capacity. And knowing that these are highly capital intensive projects, right? And this doesn't take much time to construct a project. It's, it's about 12 to 18 month cycle when you're able to deliver a project, maybe much lesser. So uh, in this context, uh, and then the all said and then while we have a very strong uh, uh, banks and uh, uh, and then the financial institutions uh, uh, space, but having said that, uh, meeting the demand of all, all, all these projects by Indian banks because of sector exposure, group exposure, borrower exposure is constrained, right? And the green bond, there, there is a there is a very wide pool of capital available, which is really willing to fund these projects. If certain uh, certain uh, special concessions, uh, we are not asking for any monetary concession, no tax relief, and so there could be there could be a series of things that can be done. But but leaving any any monetary uh, concession aside, which can have an impact on on government's uh, uh, government's uh, budget. But uh, purely from a procedural perspective, if uh, the refinancing of projects can be made a uh, lot more easier. Through green green bonds, it will it will it will it will help help the sector, and it will also help the Indian banks and financial institutions. Yeah, uh, Robbie, what do you think in terms of any uh, policies or anything which will actually be an enabler uh, for green bond issuance? I'll answer this question from from my point of view. You know, we uh, we are domiciled in India. Um, and we are very comfortable with the overall direction that the that the country has um, over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Um, so I, I I don't particularly think of you know what we want changed or what we want. We our our fundamental objective is very very simple. The government uh, can ensure one thing, which is a level playing field. And, and we are comfortable, as long as it's a level playing field, to work within 
the policy settings of the government of India. Um, naturally, you know, um, the policy settings result in certain constraints. Um, we can deal with those constraints. Uh, we will be uh, comfortable to work within those constraints. But uh, from um, in specific areas, because we cover a very vast uh, gamut of space under which our platform is operating, um, there are certain specific points where the initiatives taken by the government and the to build the technological uh, ecosystem around those initiatives will take some time. So during that time period, uh, it is important that uh, there's a recognition that it will take um, certain um, uh, period by, by which we can develop the, uh, the ecosystem of technology around say manufacturing of, of panels and and the and the techno and the technology uplift that is required within the vendors in India. So those kind of things to, to small vendor support, the government can 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 do better uh, small vendor support so that the vendor development can be faster. So that those of us who are investing in a, in a large capacities um, uh, do not have do not have to have uh, the responsibility to develop the vendor ecosystem also. Um, to give you a case in point. Um, we run our utility platform, which is uh, our transmission distribution, our conventional power generation, green power generation, and gas distribution companies on what we call a remote operating nerve center. You know, it, it required us to, we had to develop that from bottoms up. It itself is over billion and a half, $2 billion investment. You know, predictive maintenance, advanced maintenance, you know, uh, hard security systems to, for against hacking, um, because you know, imagine imagine a grid that is op now operating as a dimensional grid, and we are participants in that grid. It gets hacked, and the systems go down. So you know, hard security of the system. So there, there's a lot of, and, but that ecosystem is not fully developed in, in the country. So 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 for I'll give you an example that for our uh, uh, conventional power and distribution company and the renew renewable power plants, um, we we operate them from our head office in Ahmedabad. We can, it's all here. We have predictive maintenance, predictive analytics on it. But that means we have this pipe that goes from Ahmedabad to, to various locations, uh, 322 locations around the country where we operate. And so, so that, uh, and that requires local maintenance, local development and local vendor development. So I think if, if the government can work to support uh, local vendor development, I think that would be a great plus. Uh, I think uh, we are big enough to look up our, ourselves to work within the policy environment of the of, of, of our government. But uh, helping smaller vendors would be, I think, a big change if it can occur. Uh, Kailash, your thoughts in terms of, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, what will really help the industry? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think on the green bond side, you know, definitely a lot can be done. Uh, you know, a certain environment in which we are currently operating. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, it's it's not the most efficient. Uh, you know, there is, uh, at least on the INR side, uh, the bond markets are fairly shallow. Uh, there, you know, we have tried to do INR bond issuances in the past. Uh, we try to do green bonds with trade enhancement, uh, but the market is not just deep enough. Uh, and there again, uh, you know, we have gone to a lot of banks uh, to look at some of those issuances uh, in terms of, you know, their treasuries picking it up uh, or have gone to insurance companies. Uh, but, you know, given the structural uh, challenge of, uh, you know, the off taker credit profile and some of those uh, things you know, which is always the bane of the Indian power sector, uh, that uh, you know always comes in the way. Uh, so obviously, if the off-taker side is improved, uh, then you know the the credit markets can obviously look at adopting uh, you know these green bonds uh, more favorably, uh, and hence you know we can see wider use of of that in India. As far as the global issuances are concerned, again, uh, you know we are a responsible corporate. You know we know at what price. You know, we should be borrowing these dollars. Uh, there need not be, uh, you know, an institution 
uh, which specifies a cap rate at which beyond which I, uh, you know, that just puts, you know, an issuer in spot uh, because, you know, if the investors are requiring a higher yield uh, and, you know, if the issuer is willing to pay a higher yield because, you know, that's the only liquidity which may be available, for example, uh, then, you know, somebody shouldn't be putting a cap on that rate uh, and definitely not specifying uh, you know, that uh, that cap to be for a certain, and that cap is sort of irrespective of uh, the tenor of the issuance. Uh, so again, that that brings into uh, question that, you know, the ability of doing these bonds because an investor may want a higher rate uh, and, you know, you may be willing to pay it uh, given certain circumstances. Uh, and the pricing is also linked to LIBOR uh, or swaps plus a cap of 450, uh, which currently stands at less than 5%. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, in the same pricing cap was 7% uh, till two years ago. Uh, so obviously, you know, nothing structurally has improved in our uh, uh, power sector that investors will suddenly see lower risk and demand and lower yield. Uh, so, you know, it, those sort of caps are then become a bit unrealistic uh, in terms of uh, uh, expectations. And hence, you know, there, there is a struggle on that front. So I think there are a few changes which should be brought about on that front. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask a slightly uh, a controversial question given Sean's presence here on the panel, but, uh, and I'll start with again, uh, uh, Venkat sir, uh, in terms of certification, do you think it has any benefits? Uh, do you think it plays a role in terms of uh, greater acceptability of the green bond framework with international investors? Uh, Gaurav, before you take the, to the question that you asked, let me address the one which you previously asked all the panelists. You said that what uh, policy changes that would be required. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I did hear uh, Mr. Kailash talking about uh, the liquidity of the bonds, uh, talking about the pricing, talking about the bank's interest in these particular bonds in India. See, one of the important things that uh, the uh, bankers or the investors look at let's look at who are going to be the participants who are going to be the uh, investors in this particular bond uh, the most important thing as an investor um, i'm talking from the other side i would look at uh, one i need to see that there is a liquidity is available to me in the market number two i would like to uh, see that i'm not exposed to uh, market risk it is a market instrument and is ex definitely exposed to market risk. And three, the risk weightage, if I'm subscribing to a, 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 uh, an investor, uh, if it's below investment grade bonds, then the, the risk weightage is pretty high. Now, I'm just uh, talking out of the box. If, if the regulator wants to give some push to these particular sector, given the fact that majority of the issuances are coming from not uh, a high grade uh, in the issuers, but medium grade in issuers, is it, if the Reserve Bank of India or the regulator comes out and says that, okay, these bonds, the risk weightage for the time being, if you're putting in green bonds, let us do it at 50%. The one, two, it can be treated as a high quality liquid assets. Three, they can repo those bonds and then provide some liquidity. I mean, these are out of the box thinking. I'm not saying that it should be implemented, but if these things are done specifically in order to encourage the green bond market to begin with, then there is a possibility of more and more subscription, more and more yield compression, and there will be a good number of investors. Yeah, I think that those are very, very valid points. And I think uh, intuitively uh, they should work. But it's up to the regular. If you want to give a push to this particular, I mean, it is good, needs to be done, a long, uh, long range plan. So therefore, certain, uh, we don't make it, make it attractive to the investors. Attractive to the investors would be one, getting an E, but more than that, these are the certain other comforts if you're going to give to those investors. Maybe it'll attract more and more people to invest in these type of bonds. Sure. Um, having said that, you're coming back to your question. Yes. Uh, uh, 
when, when we invest, and if you know that CBI is giving the certificate, then I know that this particular institution has got the necessary wherewithal. They have the monitoring mechanism. They have the necessary systems and procedures in place in order to ensure that the money that is being invested is going to go for a particular purpose. So that gives a bit of a confidence for the investors, and it is always helpful for us to go for a CBI certification. Sure. Uh, so, AK, what's uh, your the experience internationally? Uh, are investors uh, looking out for these kind of certifications? I think the, there is certainly a, a preference. Uh, I think some of us probably have heard investors commenting about how green is a green bond, for example. So, um, you know, we have encountered a few situations where investors have told us that they don't think it's exactly green, or they would say that, oh, it is really light green because it's not really green enough. So I think having a third party certification certainly helps. Uh, IPMA has just sent out a guidelines for sustainability link bond. Uh, I have not got myself familiar with it yet, but but again, I think you know any any framework uh, that um, allow issuers to follow uh, with certain levels of third party certification will certainly help uh, any uh, with any investors uh, you know, question marks with respect to whether it's a, a true green bond, whether it's a light green, whether it's a dark green bond. I think. I think the third party certification do helps uh, with that. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, a uh, question for you. I think uh, you're one of the, I think the only IG rated uh, issuer in the renewable space. Uh, so what were some of the considerations which rating agencies looked at when they were rating uh, your, especially your project bond? We would, we would love for them to share with us what, what they consider. But I can tell you, I can tell you what we consider. Sure. I think um, for us, it's important to showcase that in India, um, we can create world-class infrastructure, manage it in the world-class manner, and put governance around it, that it will achieve the sovereign equivalent. So, so we are sovereign equivalent rating. So we, so the, the thing that we we would like we like to highlight is that our 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 construction contracts are are uh, always uh, on the basis that uh, the operating standard need to be the best. So even if you look at Mundra Port, our uh, our conventional power station, our transmission lines, our distribution, and our renewable power so gas, gas distribution, the standards that we put on ourselves are the same standards that once you are in our boundary, then you should not be able to tell the difference whether you are standing in India or Germany or Japan. So that's one that, so the development philosophy is crystal clear. We need to be, Gautam Adani is absolutely unrelentingly focused on the fact that all assets must be world class. Then the ONM comes in. So that is why, you know, since 2012, we started building the remote operating nerve centers. So we realized that the, 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 the tech interface with our plants is high. And the governance that was around, so we put in, the governance plans were put in place in 2013, and it took us three, four years to get them up to speed. So once we, once we were able to do that by 2015, um, the rating agencies were able to give us the benefit of governance and management. All we are in India, we have the same discoms as counterparties. And, and so, but the overlay of our, uh, the governance and management policy um, allowed them to give us the benefit that we will be adhering to certain, uh, certain uh, pattern. That, that's one part of it. The second aspect of this is that uh, We uh, we are very clear that for us um, this is not a means to pay ourselves dividends or or upsize or anything of that nature. Uh, we have never gone in the market. For example, Gaurav, you would have known um, uh, we've never gone and tapped an issue 
because the market was hot. We've never done any of that. We only do this because it makes sense for us from a capital management plan. So, so when we did the uh, project bond, which is an end to end 23 year bond um, with a 20 year restart, 20 reset. So it's a 20 year maturity paper uh, against a 20 uh, four year, 23 year remaining life PPA. The key thing that we got feedback from the rating agencies was, and also when we spoke to the investor base, uh, was the very very tight ONM uh, operation and maintenance commitments, uh, a, a very tight uh, uh, commitment to maintain uh, the the high digital interface and high uh, and continue to invest in the in the technology aspects of of our RONC. And so that the agencies were comfortable that we can maintain the the laboratory curve of the modules. Um, and and we put you know, so that, so naturally when you do that you need to be stand behind your words. So we put covenants in place for that. And so there's there's a checks and balances that occur um, on investments in tech, on um, on performance, on uh, replacement, on module quality on the default rate of the module. Uh, the, so, so it goes through a series of steps. So I think the combination of uh, development standard ONM, commitment to ONM standards for, for 25 year period and capital management to come to the most appropriate capital management. For example, no refinancing risk, no hedging FX risk for 20, 20 years. So clean fixed interest, fixed FX, uh, no foreign exchange risk, nothing for 20 years. That's what ended us in the investment grade category. Now, what agencies looked at it, at least what this is what we can say, what our discussions were with them. Oh, thank you so much. I think that's very, very comprehensive. Uh, Kailash, I have a question for you. You touched upon the fact that, uh, you know, the pricing by the regulator is a, is a constraint. Uh, do you think that credit enhancement could be a workaround in terms of uh, getting access to investors and staying within the pricing gap? Uh, it definitely is a workaround uh, to getting access. Uh, but again, credit enhancement, uh, uh, agencies are very far and few in between. Uh, and even they are fairly uh, small compared to the size of issuances uh, that you know large companies like ourselves plan. And uh, there again, then you know you are then constrained by a very small sized issuance, uh, which will not be you know, the most uh, optimal outcome, uh, given you know what the investor expectations are. Uh, but we are you know obviously uh, working on something on credit enhancement front also uh, to see if something like that can work out uh, to work around the regulation. So as I mentioned earlier, obviously uh, you know operating in India, uh, you know you have to sort of uh, learn to live within the guidelines and hence you know you are always on your toes uh, to innovate on uh, unique financing solutions uh, you know in the past we have done credit enhancement uh, bond issuances in the indian market uh, which were then rated double a plus uh, because of the first loss guarantee that we had from ifcl uh, then we have done these masala bond issuances because again at that point pricing caps didn't really work out for us when the pricing caps were out you know the direct issuance and then again now we are looking at again doing a credit enhanced issuance uh, so you have to sort of uh, learn to obviously live within the regulations uh, it's, it's good because it uh, pushes you to sort of uh, think uh, beyond the boundaries which are set for you uh, and at the same time you know continue to get access to diversified uh, sources of capital no, i mean hats of innovation in business as well as in financing so you're leading the way uh, I think we have time for one last, last question, which I'll address to Pawan. Uh, so uh, there's been news that uh, Pawan, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very well. Yeah, there's been some news that uh, Discoms are renegotiating their PPAs with uh, renewable energy companies. So what's your take on that? See, the regulatory framework and the judiciary framework is uh, pretty strong, and it is very, very supportive uh, uh, to all contracts and uh, uh, this is something that has happened in the past also but if you remember uh, i don't really want to name the state and what all happened but 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 it's it's a uh, very honestly uh, uh, it's it's uh, pretty natural right uh, whenever 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 the 
whenever some bit of disturbance comes or whenever someone sees some opportunity, any party to the contract uh, depends on, on, on the way the outlook is of the party. Uh, they, they try to take some advantage of contract contractual benefit, right? So, so that attempts have been made in the past, and uh, it was made uh, recently also. Uh, and I know you are talking about maybe AP and UP, which was the recent recent phenomenon. And uh, but but I think uh, again the the the, the framework uh, is is uh, is is pushing these kind of temptation very very strongly back. And uh, and uh, we believe that uh, we believe that uh, the sanctity of contract will continue to be honored. Uh, uh, while we can't say that such temptation may may not be there in the future, but the fact that uh, it was attempted in the past and it it couldn't succeed, the fact that it was attempted again and it it, it got a very strong pushback, uh, only give only increases our confidence that uh, while such situations might keep come keep coming as we go forward, uh, so so there are two ways to deal with it. One is that of course you concentrate more uh, with the counterparties which are. More likely to honor their contract, right? So, so which 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 value sanctity of contract uh, 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 with with lot more uh, uh, integrity than possibly some of the other counterparties. Another that even if you have some contract with some of the counterparties which uh, may have that uh, that that temptation, then you have to rely on the, on the judiciary framework and move ahead. I think uh, such things will keep coming down always. That is all I can say. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, I'll now hand over to Shashank. I think we've come to a session. So Shashank, over to you. Shashank, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Gaurav. And, and thank you all for joining this webinar on Indian Green Bonds. It has been MEFG's honor to work with Climate Bond Initiative and FIKI and host the webinar on a topic that is so very relevant in today's uncertain times. My special thanks to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Venkat Nageshwar, Robbie Singh, Kailash Viswani, Pawan Kumar Agarwal, and also to my colleague, Augusto. I can confidently say that the panel we had today was gold standard, as they are the best in class Indian green issuers. These four issuers in total have issued 13 green bonds totaling to more than US dollar 4.2 billion, which makes them the largest issuers for the Indian green bond program. They have shared today some great insights and given all of us a peek into their green strategy. I'm sure this will be very valuable to all the stakeholders of international social financing. MUFG has been a global leader in sustainable financing, and we are the top ranked Asian arranger bank in terms of the number of global green issuances. It has been our privilege to partner with this set of socially responsible issuer group and contribute our bit to promote social financing in this region. Thank you all again for the time for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you Gaurav, I just need to say there will be recordings available of this webinar You'll be able to get them from climatebonds.net slash webinars. And we will email all the people whose emails we have who tried to get on and couldn't join today to alert them. Um, so for everyone who missed out today, let them know. There will be a recording available on YouTube. Yeah, thank you for that, Sean. Uh, the webinar was sold out. Uh, and uh, the number of people who are quite unhappy that they couldn't be on, I'm sure they'll benefit from the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Take care and stay safe. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Stay happy.